We got a call from a male that was found in the backyard. About 2 o'clock this morning, someone was banging on my door. The injuries occurred here on the left side of the head. We can safely theorize there was probably a fight. People have to understand we have to put murders away. Can you explain to me about all the blood in the house? to come to this address for a male that was found in the backyard. Apparently he had some blood on his head and blood on his clothing, laying face down in the rear of a vacant home. Detective Hank Viverka has been with the Cleveland Homicide Unit for eight years. His Navy background shows in his precise investigative process. The house is obviously abandoned. The officers went inside and they found nothing of value on the inside. tell whether he died here or he was brought here. Initially, while we're looking at him, uh, we can see some blood. That might be an exit wound. Part of his... Um, left ear was also lacerated, so it looks like he was struck with something. His left rear pants pocket is ripped there. Now, I don't know if that's from somebody going through his pockets or from being dragged here. We're looking for evidence. Shell casings, uh, any type of weapon, anything that what, uh, identify the guy. This is from over his head. Now, how did it end up like that? Maybe they were dragging him, but why is it over his head like that? I don't see any evidence of any drag marks. And how come your fine crew hasn't found me a shell casing? The possibility he wasn't killed here. I don't think that he was. We can't see um, any shell casing or anything like that. And again, we still don't know how he was killed. I can't, like I said, we can't tell till we flip him, but that could be an exit wound here. Another f***ing tragedy. And what we're doing now is waiting for our SIU people to come out, start taking some photographs, and once they're done taking their photographs, we'll go ahead and start looking in the uh, victim's pocket, see if he's got any ID. On scene, I've met up with uh, Detective Hank Viverker from the Homicide Unit. They've called this a dead body suspected violence. What stands out on this body at this time is some blood staining to the top of his head. I've taken some photographs when I took the overalls from the front and then from the back. What I concentrated on was uh, the blood on his clothing, the blood on the top of his head. The scan station's on its way. I've spoken with uh, Jim Raynard. I've been called out here to set up the Leica scan. Detective Brown is assisting me, and he's putting out the markers so that we can uh, register all the different scans together. This gives the follow-up detectives the opportunity to go back during their investigation and reevaluate different aspects of the scene.
we're waiting for the coroner's office to go ahead and, and roll him, and we'll get a, a better look at what, the extent of his in, injuries. Exit wound? Okay. Well, it's a laceration of some sort with gray matter coming out. We'll see what's mm -hmm. on the front. Oh, yeah. Got an issue? Oh, man. For certain. That's trouble. There is some stuff. Now, could it be stones and things like that? Sure, but there is material here of some sort in his hair and on his scalp. And his head's caved in. Yep. Yeah. I wonder if he was just chucked there. Peanuts. Oh, okay. <laughs> I think he's got a lighter in the other pocket. It doesn't appear that he was drugged. There's no drag marks on his on his uh, bare midriff or on his clothing. So, yeah, money and a lighter. A lot change. of money. A ton of money. Loose change or folding cash? Loose change and folding cash and a lot of it. Look. Oh yeah. With money in the pocket, why didn't they take that? Dr. Tralka told us that the uh, victim died of blunt force trauma to the head. We did uh, find some unusual things here. So we're gonna have to wait for the autopsy and see exactly how it is, how he died. Boards and baseball bats, metal things. I was looking at this pole too, but the leaves and everything are on top of the pole. It's been here a while. And that'd be an awful, awful big tool to be picking up hitting somebody with. to roll the body and view that he did have a uh, uh, pretty severe laceration to the uh, left side of his head, some kind of blunt force trauma. There's no spatter. No, I There's don't. nothing. Not anything. But uh, there is no evidence here. We looked around. There's nothing. There's no murder weapon that we can find. There's nothing underneath the body. Detective Armelli is uh, new to the unit. He came in at the beginning of the month. Detective Averka decides to split up with his new partner, Tom Armelli, to canvas the neighborhood for possible witnesses. Kind of like learning the ropes uh, on how to do a homicide investigation. Yeah, this is my first homicide with Hank. We've been working together for a couple weeks now. Hank's, uh, he's extremely sharp and uh, not afraid to, uh, to speak his mind. A rookie to the homicide unit, Detective Tom Armelli has served 26 years with the Cleveland Police Department and is president of the Cleveland Police Museum. Kind of uh, trying to glean any little bit of knowledge or information I can off of him. Tom Armelli with the homicide unit. Uh, you, you know what's going on across the street? I'm the brains of the outfit and he would be the brawn and I can pretty much have him do anything I want him to do. Like, you know, maybe I might want to send him out for a cup of coffee or something. Hey, how you doing? Tom Armelli from the homicide unit. Uh, can I come in and talk to you for a couple minutes? I saw a car. It was a gray Hornet. Guy across the street, you know, he lives kind of catty corner. He said uh, about 6 o'clock in the morning he woke up, and as he usually does, he looks out the window to check the weather, and he saw a gray Pontiac. Uh, he thinks it was maybe a Grand Am or something with two young black males. Really? Occupied backing out of the driveway, so. Did he happen to get us a license plate? No license plate number. We looked around the crime scene here. There doesn't appear to be anything here that's going to help us. There's no blood. Uh, there's no murder weapon. And that would lead me to believe that he was murdered somewhere else. There's a lot of work ahead of us. Uh, knock on doors, uh, wait for the autopsy, and hopefully that's going to lead us in the right direction. The victim has been identified by the coroner's office as 66-year-old Raymond Gibson. He was living in Cleveland with his aunt and younger brother, Dana Gibson. Just got off the phone to the coroner's office. Uh, I'm going with my partner, Kathleen Carlin, who's back from vacation, and I'm going to fill her in on the way there. And once we get there, we'll see what they got for us. Hey, Dr. Troca, how are you? Good to see you again. Good to see you. Good Detective see you. Carlin. I hope you got something for us. Yeah, sure do. The injuries occurred here on the left side of the head. Uh, there were four uh, abraded lacerations on the left side of the head. The blows to the head uh, ended up lacerating the, the scalp and creating multiple comminuted skull fractures. He had one here about two inches below the top of his head. He had one about three inches below the top of the head. He had one about five inches below the top of the head. 
and then one uh, through his left ear. The one through the left ear actually pulled the left ear forward, uh, creating another stretch laceration behind that ear. And when you were out there, we were looking at the, the body. Were you able to determine, do you think uh, the body, it happened there because there was no other evidence on the scene that it happened there? No, um, and that was one of the interesting things is that the, the uh, scene was bloodless uh, as far as I could tell. The way that, that blunt force injuries go is usually the first strike uh, doesn't yield any blood because the, the first strike just lacerates the skin and then as the wound starts bleeding, further strikes then will liberate more blood and you'll get the spatter. I would assume that this is consistent with uh, the body being dumped there and the primary scene is somewhere else. Okay. Can you determine what the weapon was? Um, it's likely something relatively straight because these lacerations are, are uh, three to four inches long that not only split the skin and created laceration, but it also created all of those skull fractures and actually cut or, or tore the brain. Uh, yeah, on two of the wounds, we actually found some uh, black, greasy material on both sides of, of the tears, so that may have been left there by the weapon. So hopefully our trace evidence department may be able to link that material to a uh, particular murder weapon. So we're looking for a black, blunt object. Yes. Doctor, thank you very much for your help. Right, thank Thanks. you. Nice Thanks. seeing you again. Dr. Tolka gave some good stuff. I guess what we're looking for is some kind of a blunt object with some kind of a black, greasy substance on it. While detectives begin their hunt for the murder weapon, they get a big break. The victim's aunt, who was living with Raymond about three miles from the abandoned house where his body was found, claims to have vital information about his death. I'm on my way to uh, meet up with uh, Detective Averka. Uh, there's a couple of zone car guys who are talking to a woman on the east side who uh, they believe has information about uh, who may have killed our victim. This could be huge. Let's go in and I'll talk to you inside, okay? When was the last time you saw Raymond? Yesterday. Yesterday? 6.30. 6.30 p.m. Mm -hmm. About 2 o'clock this morning, someone was banging on my door. And I get up, <clears throat> look out the door, and it was him. About 2 o'clock this morning, someone was banging on my door. And I get up and look out the door, and it was him. Who's he? Dana. Okay, what is Dana to you? Is he My a... sister adopted him from a little okay. baby. So, nephew, I guess you would call him. Okay. Now, did Dana and Raymond live together? Yes, here. So, Dana came up the driveway. Okay. And I opened the door, not knowing what, you know, something was wrong. And he said, I don't know what happened to McKee. It sure is cold out here. And then he went on upstairs. So I come on back and locked my door and went to bed. Okay. This morning when I got up, I didn't, I looked down, I didn't see Raymond. I went on down the step and got the clothes. On my way up, I looked on the step and looked like it was blood. And I just took my hand like this and and I didn't see anything. Mm -hmm. And I said, maybe that's red paint. Then something just told me to turn around and go back. I keep a plastic garbage bag. And I opened the bag and there was a bloody towel. I took it out, it was blue. And I throw it on the floor. I left the towel down there. Mm -hmm. When I went for my dentist's apartment, mm -hmm. when I got back home, I unlocked the door. The basement door was open. I looked down. The towel had disappeared. The door was full of blood when I left. It was clean. The driveway was full of water all the way down, and I know that was unusual. So now, wasn't nobody here but him. Who could it be? Him being Dana. Yeah. So as she's saying it was all bloody when she went to the doctor this morning. She comes back, it's all cleaned up. If it is a crime scene, we have to get SIU out here, see if we can find some uh, blood samples that maybe he might have missed. This is a potential suspect in the back seat now, so we're going to have a little chat with him when we're done with her and um, see what he says. 
So it's probably both down, so it's probably point out where there's some blood. So we'll mm -hmm. take take photos, um, samples of the blood. Get to it. Let's get to it. Let's show them what we're talking about. She came down here to do laundry. She did what she had to do down here, and as she was leaving the basement, she was heading up the stairs, and she looked, and she noticed that she thought she, she thought there was a spot of blood here on the steps. So she touched it, it was dry, nothing on her fingers, and you can see right. traces of it there. She's got blood on her shoes somewhere. I mean, the only blood we can see down here is, is there's this, and in the, there's a couple of uh, spots in the sink. Now, that looks like hair, but I'm gonna have to swab that. That's an absolute. Right. Well, let's get the stuff in the sink. Um, let's, see what, let's see what else we got on the stairs. Timmy, did you see this? Up the stairs and around the corner from the basement, detectives discover even more traces of blood. I wonder if that's from him trying to clean, clean that's up? Right, that's right. It looks like somebody tried to wipe it down. It ran and dried down there. Whatever happened must have happened upstairs, huh? What the f was he covered in blood? A little blood spatter there. This may be your crime scene. You might have beat the shit out of him up here. And then if you look, you can see the smears here where where there was a spot that looked like somebody cleaned it. And there's some spots up here, you know, where you can see you can see it embedded in the in the paint defects where you know it was like so, there was blood iron and it was rubbed off and some of the blood got into the defects in the paint. what we have here is a uh, possible address or, or residence of our victim from Soika Avenue. There's some discussion right now as to whether this is also possibly uh, the scene where uh, he may have been injured or killed. Ten for now. You know, in that sink downstairs, mm -hmm. in that bottom sink, did you guys see there's... We got a call for a male that was found in the backyard. About 2 o'clock this morning, someone was banging on my door. The injuries occurred here on the left side of the head. We can safely theorize there was probably a fight. People have to understand we have to put murders away. We got a call for a male that was found in the backyard. About 2 o'clock this morning, someone was banging on my door. The injuries occurred here on the left side of the head. We can safely theorize there was probably a fight. People have to understand we have to put murders away. Can you explain to me about all the blood in the house? DOA. Then search. So we'll go ahead and seal it up and get a search warrant tomorrow. They had, they've been had bad blood, bad you know, blood for a long time. But had I not come home when they had this first fight, mm -hmm. he probably would have killed him then. And when was this? Oh, that was about um, a little over a couple of months ago. I think if you all would let me go, I'm not going to touch him. If you just let me go out there, I just want to ask him some questions. Mm -hmm. I, I really do. I don't think I can let you do that. I sure wish you would. How you doing? My name is Detective Averka with the Cleveland Police Department. I mean, where's Raymond at? I don't know. You don't know where your brother's at, huh? No, I don't. Did you come in the house today about 2 o'clock this morning? 
Dana, we got a little problem here. What happened, man? And the only way I know what happened if you tell me, man, and, and this is this is a terrible thing. It's a terrible thing. What, what were you and your brother fighting about? What were you and your brother fighting about? Nothing. Nothing. Well, how do you end up like that then if you guys weren't fighting? I don't know what you're talking about, sir. Okay. Well, I think you do. Can you explain to me about all the blood in the house? No. How come? I didn't see it. So you don't know where your brother's at? No. Well, we do. It means where you left them. Brother Dana, I think he's going to want to talk. He seems a little bit upset about something. And then what we're going to do is we're going to close the upstairs door and we're going to put what's called a corner seat. We're just going to put an orange sticker on the door and no one's allowed in there. Okay, nobody can go in. And then tomorrow we're going to come back with a search warrant. You know, it's, it's starting to look like it is him. All right, but we won't know for certain for a little bit yet and if it is you know I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry for your loss okay but we're gonna try and get to the bottom of this and find out what happened okay now I really my heart goes out to this lady uh, mrs. Griffith uh, uh, these are her two two nephews two kids never got along uh, now they're you know in their you know 40s and 50s and they're still not getting along to the point where one may have killed the other and uh, you can see she's just heartbroken down there and I, I really feel for her it's uh, it's a pretty sad thing What did Dana say when he was in the car? Uh, he said he didn't know nothing about it. I think if we push him a little bit, he'll, uh, he'll talk a little bit more? Yeah, I don't know. It seems like he wanted to talk, but um, hopefully he's going to give up what happened over there. Do you have a seat in that yellow chair there? Bring some cigarettes, help yourself. Um, what this is, this is a waiver of your rights. I need to talk to a lawyer, too. You want a lawyer before you give me a statement? I, I told I let you guys know what happened, but I, I need to talk to a lawyer. No problem, that's your right. What you're doing is you're going to acknowledge that you understand your rights and that you are exercising your rights and you do not wish to give your written statement. Okay. Hey, what we're going to do then is uh, we're going to go ahead and book you. Uh, right away to murder, we can go ahead and give you a phone call. Okay, Dana lawyered up. A statement would have been nice. Um, it was his opportunity, so show some remorse, show that it, it shouldn't have happened. It was a terrible thing, but I think he's hurting himself by not giving a statement. But we talked to his aunt, uh, Marie. Uh, everything seems to be pointing towards him, so we're going to have to go back to the house, see if we can find something to help us out with our investigation. Okay, let's go over the status of this case. Our victim's been identified as Raymond Gibson. He's a 66-year-old black male, and we found him in the backyard of an abandoned house. We found the victim lying face down. He had what appeared to be blood on his clothing and on his head, and he had a tear in his left rear pants pocket. We looked around the scene. We couldn't find anything that led us to believe that it happened here. There was no evidence, just the body. So this leads us to believe he was killed elsewhere and just dumped in the backyard. Yeah, the coroner on the case, uh, Dr. Trucco, came out on the scene. Uh, he said preliminary, he thinks he died of blunt force trauma to the head. Yeah, the doctor also said that during the autopsy, he found multiple severe injuries to the victim's skull. So we're looking for a black, blunt object. He was surprised that there wasn't more blood at the scene where the body was discovered. Um, and that kind of supports our theory that uh, that the victim was killed uh, somewhere else and the body was dumped in the backyard. How about any leads? Turns out the aunt and Dana and Raymond all live together in the same house. Um, before we found the body, the aunt found uh, blood splatters um, throughout the, ho the house. Um, she, she went out and ran some errands 
and uh, when she returned, uh, the blood had been mysteriously cleaned up. We went out to the house and we found what appears to be suspected blood in the stairway uh, leading to the second floor bedroom and in the basement. We can safely theorize right now there was probably a fight. They carried over into different areas of the house. Uh, we just don't know where they started or where they ended. Yeah, but what would send him over the edge to brutally beat his own brother? Well, we, we couldn't get anything out of Dana um, when we tried to talk to him. Uh, you know, he lawyered up. We're going to have to hope we get some forensic evidence, either from the scene, uh, DNA or something. And we also know that uh, the car is missing. We don't know if it's Dana's car, if it's Raymond's car. But we'll see if we can locate the car. And if we can, hopefully we'll be able to find something in the car. Let's go back out there and knock on some doors, see what, uh, what happens. Detective Averka gets word from officers that they have found Raymond's car, which may have been used to move his body to the abandoned house. Right now, we are on our way to the police impound lot where the victim's car has been towed. It's my understanding that the car is a total burnout. Our best case scenario would be find something in the trunk. How you doing? What's up? Thanks. Oh, no problem. They said he parked the car over on Ashbury and set it ablaze. A blaze? A blaze, or a flame, which would be correct. I think a flame would be lighter than a blaze. All right. So what I need you to do is I would like you to dust. I need uh, samples for DNA. Right. The guy that killed him, his DNA okay. is going to be in the his car. His DNA. His fingerprints, fingerprints are, are going to be in the there. car. Right. With this much fire, it makes me think that maybe he dumped everything here in the back. We started it from here because it looks like back to front. He used an accelerant, went from the trunk to the back seat, caught the front seats. What the fire didn't consume, the water would obliterate when they extinguished it. Is there anything at all we can get out of this? From what I see here, no. Something else turns up, I'll give you a call. Yeah, wish I could help you, but. Well, it is what it is. It's too bad. Since there was no evidence remaining in the charred car, detectives continue their pursuit for the murder weapon. We just went and got a search warrant to search the house where our suspect was arrested in uh, connection with the murder of Raymond Gibson. Hopefully, uh, and we'll be able to find all this stuff, and that would help build our case against him. Once inside the Gibson house, Detective Viverka and his team search the kitchen for evidence. Did you see the blood in here, boss? Well, that's blood or not. Well, that's definitely blood down there. There's a napkin in there, a paper towel with what appears to be blood on the corner of it. Adam? Up here. Well, obviously, he cleaned up. Well, there probably wouldn't, I mean, if this is where the battle started, there probably wouldn't be too much blood in here. No. The majority of the damage was done on the steps. Although detectives suspect that the conflict between Dana and Raymond began in the kitchen, they continue their search in the attic. I'm gonna assume this is the attic he was talking about. The light's still on. Got to go for a stuff is this? <clears throat> Dana Gibson. This is his stuff. What we're really looking for is anything that will help build, a, build our case against. Is there another crawl space down there? It's on this side here. It'll take a couple bags. <sighs> There's uh, two or three black plastic bags, and one of them's got red. So there could be some blood seeping through. Any 
many bags you got? Uh, one, two, three, five. Inside this uh, red plastic uh, bucket, there are these uh, candy peanuts. And these are the same type of uh, orange peanuts that were found in the victim's hoodie uh, sweatshirt jacket on scene. And we thought it was kind of unusual that they were in there. And the first bag we found was a pair of Timberland brown boots. And as you can see, it appears that there's some blood here. Oh, yeah, there's blood right there. There's the blue towel Auntie was talking about with blood and it's also damp suspected blood there and yeah, there's blood here it's suspected blood there's a lot of blood here oh yeah oh yeah okay, one pair of gray size 3632 with suspected blood splatter it's wet also on both legs. When uh, I first opened, uh, it was either the first or the second bag, you had the overwhelming smell of uh, blood. Blood does have a distinctive sweet odor. Um, and it was, it was overwhelming and it was, uh, you knew immediately what it was. Welcome to Homicide. Bring them out, rookie. Watch your head. Is that a crowbar? Yeah. Really? Could that possibly be blood? It could be our murder weapon, and there is, you can see it's disturbed here, the dirt, the dust. Still gonna have to dust because that's the first question he's gonna ask you when you're sitting on the stand. Detective, did you dust it for prints? Would you like me to? Yes, I would. Well, what I'm about to do is fingerprint the implement that is probably the murder weapon. And after that, I'm gonna lift some blood off this. All right, Hank, we're suspecting that he used this end to hold the other end. We beat yeah, we beat him with this end. Beat him with this right? end. Oh, I'd say that's blood. Hopefully, it can match up the DNA on the crowbar. That's for Raymond. Two swabs from bloody. Two swabs. From suspected blood from iron pipe. So if you always take two swabs, is that the deal? The main reason for that is when they when these go in for testing, the sample is destroyed. So when BCI would test this, um, they'd use one. They have one in reserve right. for future use, specifically for defense testing in case it ever gets to trial. And the defense says, hey, we want to have our guys test it. Our experts will test it and, and go from there. In case they didn't want to dispute the findings. Found a lot of good stuff here. A lot of good stuff that's going to help us out. We're going to take this stuff back to the station. Eventually, we've got to get some of it to the coroner's office for examination. Now we're on the right track. Now I'm on my way to the coroner's office where I'm going to hook up with my partner Kathleen and then we're going to meet with Lisa in trace evidence and what we're hoping for is that she's going to be able to pull some type of evidence off the items we got from the search warrant, uh, the crowbar and the bloody pants and if she is able to help us out and that should put us one more step closer to solving this case. Hi hey, Lisa. Hi, how are you doing today? Good afternoon. All right, let's take a look at some evidence. So what we're going to do is collect some samples here of the blood at this end. So can you determine immediately if that's blood or not? I can do a preliminary test. Um, this is called a heme stick, and basically we have our reagent here on the end. And when you stick it and touch it to our blood sample, you have a quick color change here. It looks like blood. It's acting like blood when it's reacting to our tests. So we'll send this straight on to DNA and they can do their analysis. And hopefully we can 
obtain a profile from that of a possible suspect. Okay. And I have a pair of pants here, which has some nice blood spatter on it, which is consistent with blood spatter from that would be from a beating. Can you tell from the blood splatter where the victim was when he was receiving the beating, or where the vic suspect was? The direction that the blood seems to be traveling in is in this direction here. So you're standing over the victim? He very well could be somehow over the victim. If, per chance, the victim was going down the flight of stairs, mm -hmm. the suspect standing like on a couple stairs up above him and beating down on him, on his head, would that? That's possible. I would expect the victim to be lower and the blood spattering in this direction. We appreciate you doing all this. So maybe with your uh, findings, you'll be able to help us out when we come to trial and we can finally find out what did happen over there. Roberta. Hey, hey, Lisa, how are you? OK, bye-bye. Uh, Lisa Slovak from the coroner's office called. You go over there, she's going to start pulling some DNA off that stuff we pulled out of the house. OK. All right, great. Don't forget the donuts on the way back. Donuts. I'm heading out to the coroner's office right now to meet up with Lisa because she has some, uh, some DNA evidence that she wants to go over with us. And uh, it's a good opportunity for me to uh, see firsthand what they do with the evidence that we gather at the crime scene. Hi, Lisa. Tom Armelli from the Homicide Unit. Hi, nice to meet you. My pleasure. OK, so here I have two items from the Gibson case. Uh, item 19.1, swabs that were collected from the distal end of the metal bar. And then item 19.2, swabs that were collected from the proximal end of the metal bar. So ideally, when this is over with, we'd like to find the victim's DNA on one end of the bar and the suspect's DNA on the other end of the bar. That's what we're looking to see, yes. Uh, the first step of the process is going to be to remove a portion of the swabs for testing. I took a portion of the swab and put it into a small tube. This will allow us to add buffering agents to that sample. We're going to set the sample up for an extraction. So to do that, we add ext stain extraction buffer. The stain extraction buffer has reagents that will initially poke holes into the outside of the cell. And then also within that mix is an enzyme that will poke holes into the nucleus, releasing any DNA out into solution. So we're back at the hood again, and this is the next step of the process. This is the point where we will clean up the sample. Um, we're going to add a chemical to our extracted blood stain. So the, the DNA is going to be left in the top layer, and all of the stuff that we're not interested in is going to be captured in that bottom layer. The next thing I'm going to do is mix using the vortex. Oh, wow. So you can see it turns into a cloudy emulsion. The next thing I'm going to do is take the sample. I'm going to put it back into the centrifuge. We're going to spin the sample again. And in doing so, we're going to develop two different layers in our tube. So this is our end product. As you can see, we have two layers. We have the clear layer on top and the darker red-brown layer on the bottom. DNA is going to be contained in this upper clear layer. About how long is it from start to finish to, to complete one of these DNA profiles? It will end up taking about a week. Man, I'm really uh, anxious to see the results of this DNA test. I really hope it uh, matches up with Raymond's. As Detective Armelli heads over to get the DNA test results, he has already learned that the sample from one end, tested for Dana's DNA, proved inconclusive. Now, all forensic evidence hinges on the DNA from the striking end to prove that the crowbar is the murder weapon. Hi, Lisa. Hi, Tom. How are you? Good, how are you? Good, I hear you got some results for us. I do. So if you remember, we tested the swabs from the distal end of the metal bar. Right. 
That's the striking end. The striking end opposite the handle. The swabs were tested for DNA, and the DNA profile obtained from those swabs matches the DNA profile of our victim, Raymond Gibson. Sweet, very nice, that's good. Can't uh, tell you how much we appreciate it. That just brings everything together. Uh, I mean, that'll be great when we go to court and we got the murder weapon and we got the DNA that, that guarantees that it's a murder weapon. Okay, what's the latest on this case? All right, we got some bad news is we did find uh, Raymond's car. But unfortunately, it was a total burnout. Everything inside was burned to a crisp. Uh, we had nothing in the car. The good thing is we did serve a search warrant on the house, and we found some great stuff up in the attic that's really going to help us out. They found some uh, bloody towels and some pants we think may belong to the suspect. They also found a bag of orange circus candy, just like the, the ones that they found at the crime scene. So you guys could have solved this case just by uh, circus candy? No, but we did find something better than that. We found a long crowbar that was covered with blood. And we did take that to the corner, and they did determine that the blood on it did come back to Raymond. So that is our murder weapon. That's terrific. You guys turned this case around really fast. Just out of curiosity, any theories on how this fight originated and how it progressed? Based on the evidence we got at the house, it looks like it all started in the kitchen. Moved out to the hallway and eventually ended in the stairwell. And it looked like they took uh, Raymond's body out of the stairwell and got him out of the house. What about the blood found in the basement? Well, we think that's just where Dana went to clean everything up. Did the aunt uh, give any indication what could have motivated uh, Dana to kill her his own brother? Well, she said there's been bad blood between the brothers for years, and they've had some really violent confrontations. Uh, she said it was just a matter of, uh, of when this was going to happen, apparently. Uh, we uh, conferred with the prosecutor's office, and they issued uh, papers for aggravated murder on uh, Dana Gibson. Good job, guys. Take your jacket off for me, Dana. I think probably the most important thing about this case, and it was a difficult decision uh, for Marie Griffin. She suspected something was wrong, but she did the right thing. She called the police, and it, it's got to be hard on her. I mean, this is family. I, I couldn't even think what it, what it would be like to be in a position like that. People have to understand that uh, they have to come forward. This, this is important. We have to be able to do this. We have to put murders away. And, you know, Ms. Griffin did a wonderful job for us, and we really appreciate it. mail that was found in the backyard. About 2 o'clock this morning, someone was banging on my door. The injuries occurred here on the left side of the head. We can safely theorize there was probably a fight. People have to understand we have to put murders away. Can you explain to me about all the blood in the house? to come to this address for mail that was found in the backyard. Apparently he had some blood 
on his head and blood on his clothing, laying face down in the rear of a vacant home. Detective Hank Viverka has been with the Cleveland Homicide Unit for eight years. His Navy background shows in his precise investigative process. The house is obviously abandoned. The officers went inside and they found nothing of value on the inside. tell whether he died here or he was brought here. Initially, while we're looking at him, uh, we can see some blood. That might be an exit wound. Part of his... Um, left ear was also lacerated, so it looks like he was struck with something. His left rear pants pocket is ripped there. You know, I don't know if that's from somebody going through his pockets or from being dragged here. We're looking for evidence. Shell casings, uh, any type of weapon, anything that what, uh, identify the guy. This is from over his head. Now, how did it end up like that? Maybe they were dragging him, but why is it over his head like that? I don't see any evidence of any drag marks. And how come your fine crew hasn't found me a shell casing? The possibility he wasn't killed here. I don't think that he was. We can't see um, any shell casing or anything like that. And again, we still don't know how he was killed. I can't, like I said, we can't tell till we flip him, but that could be an exit wound here. Another f***ing tragedy. And what we're doing now is waiting for our SIU people to come out, start taking some photographs, and once they're done taking their photographs, we'll go ahead and start looking in the uh, victim's pockets, see if he's got any ID. On scene, I've met up with uh, Detective Hank Viverka from the Homicide Unit. They've called this a dead body suspected violence. What stands out on this body at this time is some blood staining to the top of his head. I've taken some photographs when I took the overalls from the front and then from the back. What I concentrated on was uh, the blood on his clothing, the blood on the top of his head. The scan station's on its way. I've spoken with uh, Jim Raynard. I've been called out here to set up the Leica scan. Detective Brown is assisting me, and he's putting out the markers so that we can uh, register all the different scans together. This gives the follow-up detectives the opportunity to go back during their investigation and reevaluate different aspects of the scene. for the coroner's office to go ahead and roll him, and we'll get a, a better look at what the extent of his in injuries. Exit wound? Okay. Well, it's a laceration of some sort with green matter coming out. We'll see what's mm -hmm. on the front. Oh, yeah. Got an issue? Oh, man. That's trouble. For certain. That's trouble. Yeah, there is some stuff. Now, could it be stones and things like that? Sure, but there is material here of some yeah. sort in his hair and on his scalp. Yeah. His head's caved in. Yeah. yeah. I wonder if he was just chucked there. Yeah. Peanuts. Oh, OK. <laughs> I think he's got a lighter in the other pocket. Right. It doesn't appear that he was drugged. There's no drag marks on his on his uh, bare midriff or on his clothing. So, yeah, money. And a lighter. <clears throat> a lot change. of money. A ton of money. Loose change or folding cash? Loose change and folding cash and a lot of it. Look. Oh, yeah. With money in the pocket, why didn't they take that? Dr. Tralka told us that the uh, victim died of blunt force trauma to the head. We did uh, find some unusual things here. So we're going to have to wait for the autopsy and see exactly how it is how he died. Boards and baseball bats 
metal things. I was looking at this pole too, but the leaves and everything are on top of the pole. It's been here a while. And that'd be an awful, awful big tool to be picking up hitting somebody with. to roll the body and view that he did have a uh, uh, pretty severe laceration to the uh, left side of his head, some kind of blunt force trauma. There's no spatter. No, There's don't. nothing. Not anything. But uh, there is no evidence here. We looked around. There's nothing. There's no murder weapon that we can find. There's nothing underneath the body. Uh, Detective Armelli is uh, new to the unit. He came in at the beginning of the month. Detective Averka decides to split up with his new partner, Tom Armelli, to canvas the neighborhood for possible witnesses. Kind of like learning the ropes uh, on how to do a homicide investigation. Yeah, this is my first homicide with Hank. We've been working together for a couple weeks now. Hank's, uh, he's extremely sharp and uh, not afraid to, uh, to speak his mind. A rookie to the homicide unit, Detective Tom Armelli has served 26 years with the Cleveland Police Department and is president of the Cleveland Police Museum kind of uh, trying to glean any little bit of knowledge or information I can off of him. Tom Armelli with the homicide unit. Uh, you, you know what's going on across the street? I'm the brains of the outfit and he would be the brawn and I can pretty much have him do anything I want him to do. Like, you know, maybe I might want to send him off for a cup of coffee or something. Hey, how you doing? Tom Armelli from the homicide unit. Uh, can I come in to talk to you for a couple minutes? I saw a car that was a gray Hornet. Guy across the street, you know, he lives kind of catty corner. He said uh, about 6 o'clock in the morning he woke up, and as he usually does, he looks out the window to check the weather, and he saw a great Pontiac. Uh, he thinks it was maybe a Grand Am or something with two young black males. Really? Occupied back and out of the driveway, so. Did he happen to get us a license plate? No license plate number. We looked around the crime scene here. There doesn't appear to be anything here that's going to help us. There's no blood. Uh, there's no murder weapon. And that would lead me to believe that he was murdered somewhere else. There's a lot of work ahead of us, uh, knock on doors, uh, wait for the autopsy, and hopefully that's going to lead us in the right direction. The victim has been identified by the coroner's office as 66-year-old Raymond Gibson. He was living in Cleveland with his aunt and younger brother, Dana Gibson. Just got off the phone to the coroner's office. Uh, I'm going with my partner, Kathleen Carlin, who's back from vacation, and I'm going to fill her in on the way there. And once we get there, we'll see what they got for us. Hey, Dr. Troca, how are you? Good, Good to see you again. Good to see you. Good Detective see Carlin, you. hopefully you got something for us. Yeah, sure do. The injuries occurred here on the left side of the head. Uh, there were four uh, abraded lacerations on the left side of the head. The blows to the head uh, ended up lacerating the, the scalp and creating multiple comminuted skull fractures. He had one here about two inches below the top of his head. He had one about three inches below the top of the head. He had one about five inches below the top of the head. And then one uh, through his left ear. The one through the left ear actually pulled the left ear forward, uh, creating another stretch laceration behind that ear. Hey, when you were out there, we were looking at the, the body. Were you able to determine, do you think uh, the body, it happened there? Because there was no other evidence on the scene that it happened there. No, um, and that was one of the interesting things, is that the, the uh, scene was bloodless as far as I could tell. The way that, that blunt force injuries go is usually the first strike uh, doesn't yield any blood because the, the first strike just lacerates the skin and then as the wound starts bleeding, further strikes then will liberate more blood and you'll get the spatter. I would assume that this is consistent with uh, the body being dumped there and the primary scene is somewhere else. Okay. Can you determine what the weapon was? Um, it's likely something relatively straight because these lacerations are, are uh, three to four inches long. It's not only split the skin and created lacerations, 
but it also created all of those skull fractures and actually cut or, or tore the brain. Uh, yeah, on two of the wounds, we actually found some uh, black, greasy material on both sides of, of the tears, so that may have been left there by the weapon. So hopefully our trace evidence department may be able to link that material to a uh, particular murder weapon. So we're looking for a black, blunt object. Yes. Doctor, thank you very much for your help. Right, thank you. Thanks. Nice seeing you again. Dr. Troka gave some good stuff. I guess what we're looking for is some kind of a blunt object with some kind of a black, greasy substance on it. While detectives begin their hunt for the murder weapon, they get a big break. The victim's aunt, who was living with Raymond about three miles from the abandoned house where his body was found, claims to have vital information about his death. I'm on my way to meet up with uh, Detective Averka. Uh, there's a couple of zone car guys who are talking to a woman on the east side who uh, they believe has information about uh, who may have killed our victim. This could be huge. Let's go in and I'll talk to you inside, okay? When was the last time you saw Raymond? Yesterday. Yesterday? 6.30. 6.30 p.m. Mm -hmm. About 2 o'clock this morning, someone was banging on my door. And I get up and look out the door, and it was him. About 2 o'clock this morning, someone was banging on my door. And I get up.